What I've seen in my inter interviews are folks that don't have acute um, stress injuries, but what they have rather are lingering quandaries and and, and uh, moral residue, I sometimes call it, for what they've done. And they can't quite sort it out, but it haunts them. It sticks with them for years, and there's a lot of shame in talking about it. And I mean good old-fashioned feelings that uh, we don't like to talk about as a society. Feelings of guilt, feelings of revenge that feel great, that hepped up, psyched up, ramped up moment, but then feeling repulsed by the feelings of revenge that you had, but yet you were a sniper and you had to get the guy that got your friend if you were going to survive. Um, but then when you feel the feelings, they don't feel so savory. I like to talk about the moral emotions of war, and they include wounds, but they're the hard, bad feelings that may erode at your character, that's the really deep ones, but also just mean that you're dogged by feelings of guilt when you did nothing wrong by war's best standards. So, um, for example, you may survive, but your buddy doesn't. Call it survivor guilt, I call it luck guilt. Um, or on your watch, there's a horrific accident. No fault of your own, no culpability. The best manual said you could use a marine battery in place of an army battery in the Bradley fighting vehicle. But what happens? One of your guys turns on the ignition, the gun turret, the gun in the turret goes off and your private's face gets blown off. You know, on your watch, this horrific, horrific accident. That's, that, that dogs you as a sense of guilt, but you've done nothing wrong. So it's like subjective guilt in a way. I think we're really fighting three wars. And the Department of Defense officials often say this, we're fighting a war in Iraq, we're fighting a war in Afghanistan, and we're fighting a war against suicide. The military suicide rate is now at the same rate as the suicide rate in the general public. And that's a first, um, I believe. So there's uh, a lot that's going on. There's constant stress in this war. There's, as, as we know, there's no front line in a sense. You're always exposed with counterinsurgency you're always in the midst of a, of, you're vulnerable to a, to a bomb anywhere and everywhere. Who do you make it home with? Who's coming home with you? You go to war to fight for cause or comrade, right? And if you don't believe in the cause or you have ambivalence about the cause, which is true of many um, at various stages of war, especially Iraq, um, with a mission to look for uh, WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, then, you, then you, your cause is the comrade. And that means the vulnerabilities that go with you surviving your comrade, you accidentally killing your comrade in a friendly fire incident, or just you and your comrade somehow being involved in civilian casualties. One pulled the trigger, but the other said, okay, we're, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna run on us and we gotta do something now. It's not intended, but they're in the, they're, it's foreseen, they're in the area of the target. Those haunt for a long, long time for a life, soldiers. So I think the commingling of civilians in the area of combat, the, uh, which we saw in Vietnam, but more in this, in this war, um, important tight rules of engagement, but which nonetheless make for frustration. And, um, you know, a, a, and very, very uh, uh, heavy, heavy duties of combat long deployments and multiple deployments. I was talking uh, and a soldier, came, a veteran, I didn't know he was a veteran at the time, but he was a Vietnam veteran, said to me, we who fought in Vietnam said, we always have to be, be able to separate the cause from our conduct. Our conduct has to be impeccable, whatever the cause is. And that's been a standard line in just war theory, if you like, that the soldiers on the battlefield have their own personal moral responsibility independent of the cause. You know, the Germans fighting the Allies, both were given, you know, equality on the battlefield, and they were morally accountable each to themselves. It's hard fully to buy that because you think, you know, you're fighting, your own conduct is linked to the cause. But I do believe that even if it's psychologically hard to fight for causes you don't fully believe in, then that it, 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 it makes it, you seem like you're, so there's futility, great futility and almost um, disingenuousness. Um, you still, soldiers even when they're fighting for the best cause with impeccable standards of 
of, of rules of engagement and of battle still hold themselves so tightly accountable for what they do. We certainly need more chaplains. The chaplains have been on the front line. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of them. They're, they're going forward deployed with the, with the troops. Some of them want to be in, you know, in, the, in the squads that go out so they can see firsthand uh, when a unit takes a hit, and they're, they're right there. Um, denomination doesn't matter much. It's, 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 it's someone who, who can be there who not only has spiritual um, powers and, uh, and, and an identity, but, but psychological tra but training and, and therapy. They're a part of the, the, the mental health force. The soldiers, Marines, airmen and women that I, and sailors that I've talked to that are involved in civilian casualties, especially children, just uh, are so emotionally devastated by these incidents that they can't easily go on. One Marine unit just came back from the fall of Baghdad, couldn't go on and fight. The Marine colonel said, those were days when the rules of engagement were much laxer than now. I encourage them to not put ourselves at risk. And they, you know, in, in so doing, they may have uh, killed a, a child who maybe was in a, in a car that was clearly armed and running through a checkpoint. And I think the way we don't get it, it's children, to see a child is to see the mythic child, pure vulnerability. The Marines often are boy warriors themselves, barely older. And so, um, you know, they regress to be that kid. Or they're the Marines who by day are warriors. What else are they doing? They're setting up a city in a box. Civic order, moral order, legislative order. And here they can't bring moral order to a kid. They can't make, the, make sense of the world. I think that that moral incompetence, perceived moral incompetence, is so devastating. So I do think the rules of engagement, you know, are, are tough. Maybe soldiers and Marines grumble that it's as if fighting with one arm behind their back. You know, unfair advantage. These guys are shielding their civilians in, in military populations while we can't do everything we can to fight for ourselves and defend ourselves. But, you know, the soldiers have to take risks. Uh, the other night I was giving a talk at, in Washington State and there was a young man who was a drone operator, a drone pilot. And he said, I'm about to go out again, ma'am. He's a student right now. Um, what can I do to help myself prepare? You know, and so I was sort of on the spot there, but I, I really did think that in the case of a drone, that's such a complicated mental battle space that you're in, alone in an office, not side, you're side by side with folks, but you're not at physical risk. But you are at moral risk because you're worried that you're safe and everyone else is exposed, both the enemy and your buddies. Um, and so I thought really thinking hard about the kind of situations he would face again and going through it mentally. Um, the, the Stoics, again, have this great idea of rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Think in advance of the kinds of risks that you're going to face and try to think a little bit about the reactions. I do think that's a kind of mental anticipation that's really critical. Um, and just like we train ourselves physically to, to be ready for battle, I think you have to train yourself mentally and morally to be ready. It's not foolproof, it's not a full safeguard, but it's more than if you go naive and without any idea of what you can anticipate. You'd be surprised how many professors teach ethics and ethics of war without ever mentioning what an individual soldier will go through. They're much more likely to talk about, is that war justified? Was that past war justified? Is a current war justified? What's a terrorist like? Then they would be to say, well, what's the mental and moral space of a soldier like? And what's a soldier going to go through? And how might we protect our own soldiers? So I'd say, you know, all sorts of places, classrooms for college students, workplaces even, chaplains, the, the, um, the clinicians who are working with soldiers, units that are about to deploy, all have a role in this. Soldiers carry all the moral weight of war and we carry very little. And we need to share that moral burden by uh, realizing that they are our surrogates. Um, and th this is where, as the daughter of a World War II veteran, I, I think a lot about this. My dad carried his dog tags for 65 years in his pocket. I only found them in the hospital room after he died. I was very close to my dad, but I never really knew they were there, and he never shared it with me. And his sense was that he it wasn't something to share with the family. It wasn't part of polite conversation.
And he was a medic um, on the QE1 and Mary, Queen Mary that went back and forth as hospital boats. And his sense was that this is a soldier's personal responsibility. And he had to make sense of it as best he could all his life, but he wasn't going to share it. And I th thought, as I saw those dog tags and must have thought unconsciously most of my um, adult life with my dad, that's really unfair. He's depriving me of knowing what he went through. And um, it's not just a soldier's burden. And especially right now when we watch, watch so much footage, we listen to the news, we're on the internet, um, soldiers write blogs, you know, they're telling us we need to listen. War's about destruction, ravage, it's death-saturated environment. And your eyes see it, your nose smells it, your hands feel the charred body parts that you collect. So whether you're seeing it or being the active agent of it, you're in it. One, one Vietnam veteran put it to me by saying, you know, every pore is tainted. I can't cleanse it. I don't know how to purify it. And it's, it, it's more so when these bombs are so indiscriminate, you know, when you're just, uh, the suicide bombs just kill anything and everything in a neighborhood. So it's playing, a, a ha it's havoc on those that are coming home. But what we forget is it totally re-traumatizes those that have been to war.